So this meditation is coming from John chapter 18, verses 28 to 40. I'm going to read it for you real quick. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should be delivered, not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. There's a lot to meditate on here. It's, um, it's a really powerful juxtaposition between the kingdom of God and the, the kingdom of man, Pilate being the kingdom of man, Jesus representing the kingdom of God and truth. Um, but what really jumped out at me as I was meditating on the passage was just how easy it can be, at least for me, but I, I hope for other people too, how hard it can be to, to put ourselves in this specific passage. And here's what I mean by that. Um, when we when we do our Palm Sunday Passion Gospel reading, the whole congregation shouts, crucify him. And, and when we do that, we're making the truth of the gospel narrative, the passion narrative, present in our lives right now. We're acknowledging our position in, in the history of the passion. And like when we talk about people like Peter, that's super easy for us to to identify with. You know, we're disciples of God, but darn, we're not perfect. <laughs> but I, I don't think we often relate to Pilate. And, you know, I've just always had a hard time putting myself into it. I never really thought about it before I was asked, asked to meditate on it. You know, it's just like Pilate handed Christ over to death. It's just something that happened, like historical fact. And we all kind of have different pictures of in our head of Pilate, I think. Um, maybe for some of us, he's just almost an unadulteratedly evil figure, just pure evil he had the truth incarnate standing right in front of him. He refused to acknowledge it, and he crucified the truth. Maybe he's a more sympathetic figure. He, um, maybe he was just blind, confused, 
Um, he was in kind of a tough spot with a bunch of crazy religious people yelling at him, angry with him. But uh, in my meditating, I just I found more pilot in me than, you know, I, I think many of us would like to admit. Here's a potential framework for kind of putting ourselves in this story because we'd all really like to think that in, in hindsight especially, if Jesus was standing right in front of us, we would of course choose Jesus over the mob. But what if Jesus is standing right in front of us in the people standing right in front of us, in the people around us, in our neighbors? And what if the mob, in our case, is just the hundreds of distractions and desires and fears and rationalizations that make us less than perfect Christians? The question here isn't, you know, if we chose Jesus at some point and chose to cooperate with grace when we got baptized or asked him to save us or got confirmed or anything like that. The question is whether we choose Jesus every day or whether we give in to the mob. Because to address Pilate's question, what is truth? It's not just what's factually correct. It's not just like the sky is blue. It's kind of a true thing, but it's not it's not exactly what truth is. Truth is the way we need to live every minute of our lives. Truth is Jesus, and Jesus is truth. And we rationalize the fact that we don't always live in the truth. You know, it's, yeah, but I don't have time to dot, 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 fill in the blank with something you should do but usually don't. I don't have time to ask that church visitor out to lunch, to go to the widows and orphans and serve them, to spend more time in prayer. I've been there. <laughs> I am there. Um, those positions are comfortable. They're convenient. We might even convince ourselves that those things are true in the weakest sense of the word, that we just don't have time. Um, it might look like, yeah, I really need to kick this sin out of my life, but what mo will my friends think if I stop gossiping or cursing or drinking too much or, okay, but I'm afraid if I offer to pray for that person, they'll judge me as a religious nut. Or, yeah, but my brother-in-law was being a real pain in the butt. <laughs> and the story of Pilate, I think, shows us how easy it is to choose the mob over Jesus. It struck me as significant as I was reading the passage, and maybe someone smarter than me back here can send a signal if I'm like way off. But uh, <laughs> Pilate doesn't even exactly condemn Jesus or even to like declare him guilty, right? He, he says he's innocent. He says, I find no fault in him. But all he had to do was wash his hands of this. And now he's been remembered for 2,000 years as the person who handed Jesus over to death. And it was a convenient decision. It appeased the mob. It, and we love to make convenient decisions like that, that we think are going to make our lives easier. You know, as humans, we like to be comfortable, but comfort can be a faith killer, a growth killer. A truth killer. 
Pope Benedict, Benedict the 16th once said, the world promises you comfort, but you were not made for comfort, you were made for greatness. And it's true that we're all called to share in Jesus' greatness. We love that part. That part's awesome. You know, let's talk about being called to greatness all day. That's what we want to do. But there's another side of that coin because we're also called to take up our crosses and walk a straight and narrow path. Another way of phrasing that is we're called to live in the truth. And living in the truth is crucifying ourselves and crucifying ourselves is living in the truth. You can't have one without the other. And that's the part we hate talking about because, man, you look at that cross, you see all your fears. We talked about this a couple Sundays ago. You, t you see everything that's afflicting you. You see excruciating physical pain. You see the pain of your mother. You see abandonment. You see humiliation, vulnerability, nakedness. As, uh, as I was meditating, I, I just, I think this passage shows Pilate's opportunity to pick up his cross and not just discover the truth, but to live it. But he didn't. And I'd be so bold to say that unless someone here is, is perfect, we often... We often struggle to pick Jesus over the mob as well. And I'm supposed to end with a, a question for reflection, but I'm going to submit to you that this might be more of a prayer. And I think if we open ourselves up in humility and earnestly repeat this, 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 this prayer will always work. You, you want a prayer that God will answer? Here's one. Just approach the Father and ask, what are the things I do or don't do in my life that prioritize convenience over Christ, comfort over truth, and ease over the path of the cross? And if we humbly seek an answer, I, I think God will answer that prayer every time.